see here, my name is Olga Piragos. I'm the founding chair and professor of the new Department of Engineering here at Wake Forest. With me today and giving this presentation is uh, Dr. Michael Lamb and Dr. Mike Gross. And you'll get to hear a little bit about each of us as, as we kind of do about 20 minutes of, of a presentation to you to share a little bit about sort of the work that we've done together. Um, and then really open it up for discussion because we don't claim to be experts. We certainly have gained and have expertise and continue to gain expertise, but we really want this to be a conversation with all of you uh, because together we kind of move this and make this something that becomes meaningful for all engineers and all of engineering education. Uh, I share, we kind of did this. Uh, I know Michael and I both like to share this quote from Martin Luther King. Um, and it does really mean something to me. Uh, so the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Uh, intelligence plus character is the true meaning of education um, and the true goal of education. I truly, I truly believe this. Uh, I'm somebody that has taught thermal fluids um, and I also did teach design. And so I often go into those courses, or I used to, I used to go into those courses in my early years as an educator thinking, I will teach them conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, the Bernoulli equation. And what I realized as an educator is that's the easy stuff. Teaching them the equations, the concepts, that's the easy stuff. At the core of what I do is really get them to understand who they are and how they can be good engineers in those critical decisions and technical decisions that they have to make. So I truly believe that we're here to educate the whole person, the, the, the whole engineer, and, and it does. It's about, it's about character, it's about the personal growth beyond those equations that I know we all, we all do as well. So quick, quick overview. Um, I'm probably going to skip some parts that I will do just to kind of make it and allow time for discussion. The webinar I know has been recorded, so it will be available to others in our community. This is our team. Um, engineers, philosophers, psychologists, assessment experts, uh, engineering education researchers. So, so we're really grateful that our, our current Kindgren is able to support two postdocs, and that's Adetun and Joe, and I think Joe and Adetun are here, are joining us. But there's so many others on our team in other ways and funded in other ways that really complete the, our team and, and, and individuals that work with Michael with, with his program. Um, and so I can't speak enough to the immense power of this team that we brought together. Uh, it's taken a little while to kind of bring all these areas and, 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 and we're excited to kind of share a little bit of what we've done. None of this could be done without the engineering faculty. Um, these are all founding faculty because we haven't yet graduated our first cohort of engineers. They have embraced what it means to teach in a liberal arts university and in, in teach the next generation of engineers in that context and truly have embraced what it means to infuse virtues and character education in our curriculum. And so without them and, and, and continues to su continuously supporting them and, and, and learning from each other, none of this would be possible. I also want to give a shout out to our external advisory board. Uh, some of you will recognize yourselves here or, or, uh, or will recognize people here. We met with this board for the first time in June and we asked them to challenge us and they sure did. They challenged us to rethink how we talk about and how we have these conversations. We're really, really grateful to them. This, also, this group also represents philosophers, engineers, historians, um, linguists, er, educational researchers. And so in many ways, we brought in the diversity to, to, to grow. And then hopefully many of you also recognize yourselves here because we've also immensely benefited from this advisory group. I feel like the name keeps changing slightly. Ethics, character education, right? It's all of that. Um, and I know I probably have missed a few. I was trying to kind of pay attention to the emails um, and really grateful to Doug who actually made this happen. He's been telling us, you guys need to showcase and tell us a little bit more. So really grateful to Doug and apologies if I have missed someone. Um, and of course, um, 
the, the, the keen program officers and the keen team has also been kind of the backbone pushing these conversations to happen, pushing for this work to happen. I'm not sure if Doug Milton is here, but when I Google to find, when I Google the names and find to find pictures of you, that's the first one that came up of Doug Milton. If he doesn't like it, here's a, here's a more professional version if you prefers that. So if he's not here, you can tell him that we've covered both bases. Um, really, really quickly, how we came to be um, and working with Michael Lem is our first year here of starting the new program. We spend easily two to three hours a week envisioning what we want our engineers to be. Who do we want our graduates to be? Who is this ideal graduate? And how do we get there? And upon sharing the 25 page document with Michael Lem, everything in red, which you see on the right side, is what he saw as virtues. And so it, that sparked a conversation that has lasted the past three years in allowing us to think about these virtuous engineers. And it kind of became for us a vehicle to achieve this mission and this goal to educate the whole engineer. Um, now, what I'll do is this. Michael, as you get started, let me find the, the chat. So we'll ask you, we'll ask a question. Um, I'm going to share a link with everyone right now, and it's a Google spreadsheet. It, it came with the invitation to join this discussion. Um, and we, instead of the chat and everybody's sort of question, everybody's questions popping up and, and feeling like it's, it's interfering with listening and paying attention to what questions are being, um, are, everyone has. I'm going to share the Google spreadsheet where you can add your questions there. So as we go along, we won't take questions, but we'll save them for the discussion part to be able to kind of allow everyone to contribute to those. So if everyone can use the Google spreadsheet to ask your questions. Michael, it's, it's on to you. How did I do? Uh, Michael is our time tracker. Well done, Olga. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. My name is Michael Lamb. I direct the program for leadership and character at Wake Forest. And it's been a great joy for me to be engaged with the engineering faculty this year to do this work in the engineering department. Um, so we want to explore this session, what is character and why might it matter for us uh, as educators within engineering? We have 10 reasons at Wake Forest we focus on character and I'll just list them here very quickly. Uh, first, it makes us a better human beings. Research shows that certain virtues help us flourish, both as individuals and also as communities. Second, it makes us better citizens. We need virtues like justice and empathy and humility to be really good citizens to help advance the common good. Third, it makes us better engineers, and Olga will say more about that in a few minutes in her presentation about why we think this is very valuable for helping to expand engineering education and practice in our current context. Relatedly, it does support several important academic and ABET outcomes. Research shows that certain virtues like grit actually does increase GPA and academic success, and that certain virtues uh, might help us reach certain ABET outcomes, not just around ethical reasoning, but also around communication and teamwork. Fifth, it offers a very holistic approach to ethics that goes beyond simply teaching skills or helping students make decisions about dilemmas. Those are very important parts of ethical decision making, but Character really expands not just beyond decision making, but also motivation and intention and action. So it's a more holistic approach to these important questions. Six, it's a more holistic and thicker vocabulary to assess ethical situations, motivations, and behaviors. Rather than saying something is right or wrong or good or bad, we can call it just or unjust, empathetic or indifferent, humble or prideful. We have much more sort of uh, resources to really analyze and understand who we are and who we want to become as engineers. Seventh, it's a more aspirational approach to ethics and simply compliance. Compliance is very important, but having a threshold uh, might not get us all the way to where we want to be ethically in our practice and in our lives. Eight, it addresses certain uh, trends in emerging adulthood, which uh, students from 18 to 29 find themselves in. So research shows, for example, that emerging adults are much more self-focused than others. So having character can help sort of turn us away from ourselves toward the community beyond ourselves. <coughs> Uh, nine, uh, character education help, enables us to be critical and intentional about how we actually form students in our college and our culture. Uh, formation is happening all the time. It's an inevitable part of what it means to be a member of an institution. So if we can be alert to that, we can be critical about that and also more thoughtful about how we do that in our various contexts. And then finally, in light of that culture, we uh, at Wake Forest have a 
culture committed to educating the whole person and fostering humanity uh, in ourselves and others. And so this really does align with our vision of what Wake Forest ought to be as an institution. So what do we mean by character? Uh, we understand character to be the set of disposition, stable, deep, and enduring that define who we are and shape how we think, feel, and act across time and across various circumstances and situations. So it's part of our moral identity that inclines us and shapes us uh, in a way of being in the world. So in that sense, actually, it includes four different components. One, ethical perception and awareness. Two, decision-making and reasoning about ethical matters. Three, motivation, intention, and emotion. And then finally, ethical agency and action. Often, ethics is done as mainly by decision-making. You have a tough decision, figure out what you ought to do in this case. That's very important, but also much goes into that decision before it arises itself. The perception we have, the motivation we have, all shapes how we act in that moment. So in that case, actually, there are two kinds of character traits we focus on in our program. Uh, you go to the next slide, Olga. Uh, one is virtues, the, the good habits that dispose us to think, feel, and act in the right ways at the right time about the right things and for the right reasons. And then finally, vices that are habits that are the opposite. They actually expose us to think, feel, and act in the wrong ways or at the wrong times or for the wrong reasons. So these are kind of two traits we think about as being part of what makes up our character. So what are kinds of virtues that we focus on in our program? Uh, we have four categories that we take here from the Jubilee Center for uh, Virtues and Character in, in Birmingham, UK, who've identified kind of four categories that really help define various kinds of virtues. The first category is intellectual virtues, those that help us think well about certain contexts or situations. So curiosity, creativity, critical thinking are all important parts of how we order our thought in the right ways. Moral virtues focus on how we can sort of achieve certain moral goods or maintain moral relationships in our own communities. So empathy, honesty, courage are all important. Uh, moral virtues. Performance virtues are the virtues we need to actually help us achieve any other goods. So we need resilience to endure difficulty or teamwork to actually achieve common goods together as a team. And finally, civic virtues are those that orient us toward the community beyond ourselves, outward into the world, and shape how we engage that community and promote its flourishing. <laughs> so we actually use uh, various strategies based on research to cultivate each of these virtues. Uh, we have seven here we've, we've done research on that research in psychology, philosophy, sociology, and education have shown to be effective ways to form character. I'll just mention them very quickly. Uh, first is habituation through practice. We learn virtues like we learn skills by repeating them over and over again until we actually have a second nature that, that is part of who we are and how we act in the world. Second, reflect on experience to understand what we did well and what we could do better next time. Third, we engage exemplars, role models who might offer a model for us to emulate or to learn from as we go throughout our lives or in our fields. Fourth, we have conversations about the virtues themselves to increase virtue literacy and help us understand how to apply virtues in different contexts in different ways. Fifth, we raise awareness about situational variables and implicit biases that might actually form our character in ways we don't even recognize. So how can we actually work to understand those and then counteract or correct those as we think, feel, and act in the right ways? Six, we use moral reminders like honor codes, for example, to make norms salient and remind us of who we've committed to being and who we aspire to be as students, faculty, or staff. Then seventh, we use friendships of support and accountability to really give a, a context for moral formation that is, is supportive, but also holds us accountable to our best selves, to our deepest values and commitments. So these are kind of seven ways we actually try to incorporate uh, methods into our program. And Michael talk more about how we do that with various modules. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, what does this mean now for engineering? Why everything that Michael shared, kind of how, where, what impact does it have for us in thinking about engineering education? I'm really, I'm really proud of our team because in the first year working together, we were able to produce, we've taken a scholarly approach to the work we've done and we've produced two scholarly publications. One published uh, at the Frontiers in, Frontiers in Education Conference, which is engineering education focused. The other one is ASWE. This very first publication, we wanted to sort of start and initiate this conversation thinking about character. And so we latched it on and thinking about ethics because everyone is doing ethics. Um, everyone is thinking about ethics in terms of decision making. And so this became for us a conversation and thinking about reimagining how we do ethics. And through that, be able to sort of use virtue ethics as a lens upon which we can change how we've done ethics and rethink how we do ethics. And so this paper, I'm not gonna go into detail because you can find it. And if you can't find it, just let us know, we'll get it to you. It's, it's this distinction between, think, between thinking about consequentialism and thinking about 
this focus on outcomes or consequences and how we make decisions. Dientology, which is this focus on duty and compliance or some rules that we have to follow. And then this idea of virtue ethics, which is really about flourishing. It's about these virtues that enable us to sort of flourish at an individual level, but at a community level as well. And so it is, these are differences. When we've looked at the literature and how we do ethics education in engineering, it's much, very much compliance based and very much consequentialism and dientology. And so for us to rethink how we do ethics, virtue ethics becomes a powerful vehicle to have those conversations. And there's even an example in that in the paper, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it, but I know we've all done the challenger disaster when we think about ethics um, or other disasters like this to talk about how bad decisions were made. And, but that's kind of where it ends. Somebody made a bad decision. What the virtue ethics allows us to do is change the conversation and talk about courage, talk about humility, talk about inclusion as those virtues that enabled us to make a decision or to not make a decision and to see that and learn from that in, in particular cases. And so there's examples of that in that paper. Um, our second publication was thinking about the fact that we do, we do care about character as engineers. It's not like this is disconnected. Uh, we do talk about these virtues, but not so much as virtues, rather more, more like skills. And so it turns out in the engineering education literature, we do talk, we talk a lot about critical thinking, which is an intellectual virtue. We talk a lot about empathy, which has, was brought up in the chat as well. Uh, which is a moral virtue. We talk a lot about service, a civic virtue, and teamwork. These are kind of embedded, um, these are embedded sort of conversations and work that we do in the engineering classroom. But there's a power to talking about them from a virtue lens and going beyond thinking about it in terms of skills. And so that's kind of what this paper is about, is to help us rethink again how we do certain things, but we can do them better um, from a virtue ethic lens. At the end of the day, what does it mean to be a virtuous engineer? It is about making decisions. Um, it's, about, it's about understanding the decisions we make. Um, it's about thinking about what are, what, it's about justice, equity. We talk to our students right now, I'm teaching capstone, so that's kind of fresh in my mind. Who the students choose to interview to derive their system requirements is a decision. To what extent do they realize that that decision and even the questions that they ask impact the result of the project, but also impact their character is really powerful. And so it's, it's about justice, it's about empathy, it's about respect, it's about this curiosity that is part of the entrepreneurial mindset that Keen also very much represents. Humility, honesty, integrity, teamwork and team building, courage to step up and to stand up when you see something that, that is not right, uh, to stand up for yourself and to stand up for others, like leadership, resilience. So these are all the things that we talk about in the decisions that we make every day as individuals and as engineers. Um, and so this is a question for us to think about and maybe come back to it during the discussion what is the cost of inaction? So if we don't have these conversations, what is the cost? So if we're trying to rethink and reimagine how we educate a better engineer, is this part of it? Is this part of the vehicle to get there or not? Um, really quickly, our work um, together has focused a lot on faculty development, uh, a lot of in building the team that we have uh, preparing the resources that become powerful for the faculty and for the students to be able to understand and have a common language. We've developed several virtue modules across the curriculum. We've taken the scholarly approach. We've always mapped it to ABET. So we're not seeing this as we do this here and we do that there. It's linked into what every program and every engineering program has to do, which is, which is ABET. And then assessment, this is kind of where we're spending a little bit more time this year to, to be able to measure that impact and be able to kind of talk about that. 
Okay, Mike. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces and some new faces as well. Uh, so this part of our talk here, I wanted to get more into some details about how we kind of rolled out, how we created some virtue modules in our curriculum. So first goal is that our program, we want to uh, develop virtuous character in our students through curricular interventions. So we particularly want these to be in the classroom. And our approach is number one, we need to educate our faculty. And, and Michael Land and his team have been critical in helping us uh, think through and, and better understand how we can do that in a, an efficient and an effective way. So, we, so as an example of what he went through, what is character? What are, uh, and then going more into detail about some of the definitions and examples and things like that. Another approach that we took is that we wanted this to be modular and we wanted it to be integrated throughout the entire curriculum. So we didn't want this to be in an elective. We didn't want this to be a standalone course. We wanted this to be something that our entire faculty or our entire program uh, was engaging with. And another important piece uh, that we've been thoughtful, thoughtful about and we continue to be thoughtful and working on is how do we design these modules so that everybody in the department can pick these things up. We can learn from each other. Um, we can see what others are doing. But we also not only want to do this uh, through design, but we want to make sure that we're documenting this in a way uh, that it's, it's helpful and it's useful for everybody. And then the second goal is more broadly that we want to develop character virtue modules that are adoptable and adaptable by other faculty, by other programs beyond just Wake Forest. So whenever we're thinking about how do we create these things, what courses might they be in, uh, how, we, how might we be assessing these things, we're also, how do we document these things? We're also thinking about, uh, we're always having a back of our mind, how can we create these things in such a way that somebody else can pick this up and, and run with it and, and it doesn't feel like it's too much of a barrier to, to, to move forward with it. So in this case, we're also thinking about, you know, how do we create documentation that allows uh, other faculty to be educated uh, in, a, in a fairly efficient and effective way? And then again, how thinking about how those modules are designed and how we document them to, to achieve goal two as well. So implementation, uh, like I said, we're focusing on creating modules uh, within courses across the curriculum. And I, when I really thought about what happened, especially in the, in the first, our first foray here, we really wanted to give faculty autonomy. Um, a lot of people, if you know me, you know I'm big on autonomy. But what, what does that really mean? We kind of just open it up to the faculty to say, to introduce them to character, to introduce them to virtues, thinking about our program and our goals beyond that. You know, what courses could you imagine perhaps creating a virtue module? And what, what virtues might you focus on in those? Uh, what interventions might you use? What strategies of those seven strategies for character development? Which one of those makes sense to you? And so we wanted to give faculty autonomy to make choices in all of these areas, in whatever it might be, whatever course, what virtues, what makes sense to them. And then we wanted our team, we just wanted to make our team available to them. If they have questions, if they need to work through something, if they have some ideas they wanna talk through. So that was our approach. Um, so in some cases, Faculty found it uh, fairly easy to either adopt or adapt things they were already doing in their courses, which is really refreshing. I think that allows for a lower barrier for entry uh, for a lot of faculty, uh, including myself. I, I did a module on teamwork, uh, but it was very easy when Michael Lamb gave his presentation to make connections between what we were doing in teamwork and what he was talking about with respect to teamwork in, uh, being, or, uh, being a virtue or a virtuous team worker. Some other faculty completely created new course activities uh, they, they recognized some, some virtues or some opportunities and they felt it was important and they wanted to be able to create new activities to, to achieve those things or to help students develop those things. Um, we have several that have been formally documented, some modules. Uh, we had other faculty that kind of dipped their toes in the water and just wanted to try some things out. And then this past semester in the spring, uh, some faculty just downright got disrupted with with the shutdown and everything else that was going on. So um, we have a kind of a, a mix of, of, of how the modules have gone so far. I think it's, it's okay. I think it's actually gone very well. 
And I think uh, we're starting to see even just this year, even though we're not presenting about it now, that some of those informal modules are already uh, shaping up and developing into being something more formal, which was great to see. Michael Lamb gave you a more uh, complete list of virtues. Here I'm showing the virtues that faculty uh, in our first uh, a year of doing these modules chose uh, to identify and to focus on in helping uh, our students develop. You'll notice, uh, I, I, do, I do feel like I wanna point out that there's a big gap there uh, with the civic uh, perhaps. Uh, I, I think it's pretty easy for us to imagine uh, courses and, and educational experiences that um, would map to service. It just happened to be in this case that that wasn't one uh, that we did in our first pass. And we didn't do this on purpose either, but it was really uh, great to see it in the end that uh, the modules that ended up being created and that we ran with spanned the entire curriculum. So we, we really had uh, our 100, 200, 300 goes by year. So we had a module in first year, second year, third year, and then 313 with capstone. So um, what also we're showing here is not just the course, we're showing you what virtues were uh, focused on in those modules and those other in those courses. Um, something else that that we kept track of was uh, which strategies did, did faculty use to help support student development of these various virtues. And something else that I know we talk a lot about and, and it's brought up a lot in, in keen activities and things like that as well is, is, it, is, it, does this, uh, is, is there a connection to ABAT? And yes, there is, and it, and it really isn't uh, forced. It's uh, pretty natural if you start looking at these things and, and, and you look at uh, the outcomes. Uh, here you can see just from these four modules that, that were created by our faculty that we were able to map them to uh, these ABED outcomes. So for uh, the documentation, I'm gonna go a little more uh, quickly here. Uh, one page summary was intended to give you a snapshot of the virtue, give you a, a quick feel to see if you wanna dig into the details. If you wanted to dig into the details after seeing that one pager, uh, we have a lot more information uh, into the details of how to actually uh, carry through. I think if you click on the next slide, Olga, that might help with that. Yeah, so detailed description. Uh, okay, so here we're showing a module on computational modeling. Um, this was uh, actually a series of reflections that were done over the course of a semester. And these are some examples of the ABIT outcomes, the strategies, and some of the descriptions. You have the next slide, Olga. I think, uh, I, think I have like one more minute here. So uh, I, I just uh, wanted to point out that a lot, what we have found through this work is that not only is something like teamwork, which we all talk about as a virtue, but in doing the teamwork module, we found that there are a lot of other virtues that students enact in being a virtuous team worker. And so in giving feedback, we see them um, enacting virtues like courage and honesty and compassion, uh, having practical wisdom through experiencing teamwork, uh, having humility and receiving that feedback and being creative in ways that they can be a more virtuous team worker. And for the next slide in making connections to entrepreneurial mindset, um, we've noticed or we found that uh, through some of uh, the virtues that we're focusing on, that it's easy to tie these things um, to an entrepreneurial mindset as well. So uh, authenticity, students thinking about uh, choosing projects that have a personal sense of purpose, empathic practices, implications of those practices, teamwork, recognizing opportunities, learning through mistakes, and one of the three C's is a virtue, curiosity. Okay, uh, I'm getting nice nudges, and so I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, we did good, considering we started this a little bit late, I think we did good with the timing, thanks, thanks to both Michaels. So now is the time to uh, see the questions. Um, these were three questions that were submitted before uh, the webinar, and so, I think my I think the first question Michael will take, but let this be a conversation. So this is where now you can unmute yourselves after you know and 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 have a discussion. 
Um, so I think question one, Michael will take. Question two, Mike is taking. And I think question three, I'm taking. And then we'll kind of just continue with whatever you've submitted in a Google spreadsheet. Great. Well, thank you, Olga and Mike. And thank you, Doug, for this great question. I think it's really important to think about how we actually support development in a kind of cultural way. And I think what we've been doing at Wake Forest is think about how we can actually build a culture where um, we have these interventions as part of the whole process, not just one course or not just one standalone uh, module. And so that's been very important for us to kind of weaving it throughout the whole curriculum. So I think a modular approach is very important for that. I think also having faculty buy-in is crucial uh, to have faculty being the ones themselves, both doing this work, but also embodying the kind of traits and virtues we actually want our students to have is critical. I think having also really strong leadership. I've been very impressed by Olga and Mike at how they've really helped to set a standard for how this is what defines Wake Forest engineering. And that kind of leadership from the top is a, a crucial way of setting a culture where everybody really values that. But it's not simply top down. What I love about their leadership style is they really invite faculty engagement, faculty uh, feedback, faculty ownership of this work. I mean, that kind of shared leadership, I think is very crucial to having a culture wide approach to this, this important challenge. somebody like to add to that um, in helping answer Doug's question? Okay, to, I mean, to add, I would add just one thing that also I think is unique and something we, we have really actively done is the student voice. So in, in building our engineering program, the students are a key I mean, we're trying to produce a better engineer. So their voice and their word choice also allows us to connect things and improve not only what we're doing in the curriculum, but we use the challenges that they identify to now bring it in and connect it to things that, that are that, that, that are related to character. So it's, it, it certainly is a, a culture, a focus on culture and inclusion of all those voices that need to be around the table. Mike, you wanna take the next one? This is Sarah's question. Yeah, sure. So how can other initiatives like the Grand Challenge uh, Scholar Program be used strategically to assist with character development? <clears throat> um, I have a couple things I guess uh, just, just came to mind now about the, the Grand Challenges Scholar Program because I, I was able to, to go to the conference a couple of years ago. It was really interesting, just from my point of view, it was very interesting to see how very wide ranging the approaches uh, to the Scholars Program was, what types of students, how many students were involved in things like that. So um, when I, I, I think that um, first thing I guess I want to say is I, I think that it is pretty easy to map or help develop uh, students, help students develop virtues beyond just the Grand Challenges Scholar Program. I, I think that's something we can do in the classroom as well. But my goodness, if you look at uh, what the tenets of the Grand Challenges Scholar Program are, um, Talent, I, I had to, I'm going to make sure I got this right. Talent competency, multidisciplinary competency, um, viability, multicultural competency, social consciousness. If you, uh, what I would really encourage you to do is um, if you start to look at the definitions of the various virtues, which is something we're working on for our faculty handbook, uh, just as an example, authenticity, um, thinking about choosing a project that you connect with uh, on a personal level or that you would see a, a, a sense of uh, personal purpose, sense of purpose. Um, empathy, understanding social and economic inequalities and in, that lead to positive change in social and economic justice and general well-being. Service, uh, behavior orientation driven by empathy um, to lead to impactful action for others. Resilience, persevere towards good ends in face of adversity. There are a lot of these, a lot of virtues that you can, I think you would easily see that would map to the experience of going through that Grand Challenges Scholar program. Um, which ones you choose, you know, I, I think it, it could be up to the, to the mentor, it could be up to the student, but I think having a, a healthy sense of 
the various virtues, what they are, how they can support each other, and how enacting these virtues um, and being virtuous in these ways can help support making your project more effective uh, and having more impact it, it would be a, a great approach to take uh, for that. Sarah, would you like would you like to kind of respond to that, add to that, share some some of your thoughts and your experiences? And if I'm totally missing the mark on answering your question, I'm sorry. I, my right daughter go ahead and tell me, and then I'll try again. I'm sorry. My daughter had asked me a question, and I left for a minute, <laughs> so I didn't actually answer your. I didn't well, hear your uh, whole response. <laughs> just so you know, I did an excellent job. So it's good. Fine. <laughs> I'll watch. I can watch the recording. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just missed my. I missed my question. No worries, no worries, Sarah. I know that there's a lot of keen partners who definitely are doing a Grand Challenges Scholars Program. And so yeah, we're, we're part of the Grand Challenges Scholars Program. Well, and, and so I'm inviting others who are doing that are their institutions to kind of help answer this question in terms of what role, yeah, what, the, what role does the Grand Challenges Scholars Program offer? Anyone else want to contribute? I think just the uh... The whole idea of empathy when when students are thinking about uh, you know which which challenge to pick, it usually comes down to some kind of um, problem they see in the world that they're maybe even mad about or just very interested in. There's some certain passion that fuels their reason for doing this extracurricular thing, and so I think uh, you know there's an opportunity there for them to. Um, develop exercise and, and reflect on the, the why behind the uh, uh, endeavor they're going to invest time in. So th there's clearly, I think, a, a role for empathy development. Thank you, Bob. Mike, you going to say something there? Actually, I was going to almost probably speak for you. I was, I was going to say uh, that Olga talks a lot about authenticity, which I think maps to, to what you just said, Bob. Olga, Olga talks a lot about choosing projects that, that, that give you that, that you get intrinsically excited about uh, that that speak to you that 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 you want to be uh, that kind of speak to you in a way that that you're driven um, with purpose as opposed to I need to pick something I'm just going to pick something so I, I think the way you described it maps well to some to some other virtues in, in character development as well. Well, and it goes, it goes back to, you know, it, it's autonomy, right? It's purpose. It's in every course, in every course we teach, we, students select the area they want to sort of study. So there's, so I think two things to that. Um, I think Grand Challenges is really an initiative to allow, uh, to allow the real world to come to the classroom. And that's what we have discovered too, is that anytime you bring projects that truly are authentic in representing the real world, it's very, very easy to talk about all these other layers beyond the technical aspects that allow us to infuse character, that allow us to infuse ethics, that allow us to think about policy, that allow us to think about working with others beyond engineers. And so to me, the grand challenges is just simply another label that allows real world authentic experiences to make it to the classroom. And anything you call that, I think it, 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 it just creates a, fer, a fertile ground to talk about virtues and talk about character. Okay, just move, to move on. Sarah, you gave us a really hard question with your number three, so we're gonna skip it. <laughs> I was gonna open it up to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I was, if, okay, so audience, look at question three. And then we come back to that. We'll let you think about that one. We're gonna we're gonna move on to the next one, and I'll try to I'll, I'll try to tackle that one. But I really want to hear from you all too. We all want to hear from you, Sarah's uh, question number four also came from Sarah. Um, what should and if anyone doesn't have the? Let me. I will share the question in the chat in case not everyone is. Does there, is everyone in the Google spreadsheet? Yeah, I'm, I was going to throw out there that uh, I saw JD's question, I think was next in, the, in line there. And it's the exact same question I asked Michael Lamb uh, more than once. So, it, it, and, I, and I think it's a question that is going to pop up a lot 
in our in our engineering community and our keen community. So I think that might be one that I, I would like to um, have yeah, my, Michael already, Lamb talk about. <laughs> I already not Michael, but his that one is his. Um, but to Sarah's question about what should the response and responsibility of, of the engineering profession be to issues of inequity and racial injustice? And how do we help our students grapple with this? How do we discuss this in class? It's such a, it's such a urgent, real, needed question. I really appreciate that. And there hasn't been, I will tell you, there hasn't been a meeting where as, as chair or in, in sort of out, outside professional services that, are, that I do work, whether it's ABET, whether it's part of um, some NSF initiatives, this is constantly coming up. So the answer is, I think we have an immense responsibility. Whether or not we're doing anything about it is, is, a, is, a, different, is a different question. Uh, I think we do have immense responsibility and, and, an, and, and, and an opportunity to, uh, to build community around this and an opportunity to empower every member of our community, whether that community is the classroom or that community is a department, to, to, to raise these issues up. What often happens is that we don't know what to do with it. So we oftentimes simply do not bring it up. And, and, and fear that we can't please everyone in the conversation that it will lead. And I think what becomes really important is to emphasize um, the virtues of one, authenticity and courage, right? Because it takes courage to be able to have these really important conversations, um, but also in, in a well-facilitated environment where it doesn't have to be um, it shouldn't be dismissive. It should be an environment where everyone can share those opinions. We do not have to agree with all those layers, but it becomes really critical for all of us to also take ownership and think about what role and action do we take as individuals, but also as a profession. Um, so I'm encouraged that you say you've been this discussion is happening in various circles so that I think that's the start that people just start talking about it. Yeah, and yeah, it, it is. It, it's happening in every conversation that I'm in and I think it's happening in small, in small sort of circles and, and, it be, and, and we need to just have some broader conversations but also focus on action. Like what do we do? I will tell you that over the summer when our students went back home, when the craziness of um, kind of moving to online so quickly, when we were all sort of past that kind of craziness, um, I shared an opportunity with our students to, to kind of highlight and for us to spotlight both the positives, where are their examples where we have felt supported around these challenges but also for them to use their voice and their experience to be able to identify these areas that, ha that they have struggled with or they have experienced an injustice and to allow that voice to be heard. And so we will be working this semester to make those voices visible. Uh, the students were, uh, were invited to kind of leave those responses to be anonymous or not and to just allow this conversation to happen. Um, so I will just stop there and see if anyone else has anything to add to that. I guess I'm, I'm sort of interested in how it relates specifically to engineers and engineering profession, not just generally to universities and, you know, professionalism in general like what's the role of engineers I'd like to have that conversation maybe it's a separate in a separate discussion <laughs> but because it's probably a long conversation but. yeah I um that's a that's a good one let's if everybody can think about that let's see if we can well I'm looking at the time um, yeah, not necessarily for today, but just if people are interested in this discussion, I, I'm trying to work on it with, 
Grand Challenges students and uh, <laughs> and just others are um, Nesby chapter and thinking about like could we make a statement and then that comes into issues with the administration and like I'm just trying to understand the landscape and <laughs> how do we do something as engineers generally professionally and it, like I'm part of the Grand Challenges program and they said so much about COVID and what engineers can do to help with COVID and I've, I really haven't heard very much except that we support diversity in the workplace, you know, whatever, they, there hasn't been that much coming down in terms of leadership on in this area. I will tell you sometimes when I, have done, when I don't have an answer, I actually go and ask and I say, what should we do? And that usually sparks ideas and just asking the students, the faculty, the administration, sometimes it creates that initiative to get started. Mm -hmm. Michael, the next one is yours. Um, this is JD's question. Great. So thank you, JD. About question about how do you um, shape character? Can you shape character when students are already so entrenched when they arrive at university? How do we think about that context um, uh, of formation? I think you're right. There's a challenge for us versus shaping younger children, for example, and how we shape character. But I, there's some encouraging uh, research about this. I think it's really helpful for us. So there's a lot of research showing, for example, in psychology and sociology that actually the period of, of emerging adulthood, so 18 to 29 especially, is also a critical time of moral development because now that students are marrying later, uh, having children later, having more jobs, having more education, their identity and formation is still in flux. And so it's a really important time of actually directing their values and their virtues in ways that help them form their moral character. So actually that research shows it's an important time for that kind of development. And secondly, we have to recognize the limits of that. Uh, that we won't sort of change somebody dramatically. How do we then sort of think about revising their character versus replacing it, right? How do we help them sort of understand their motivations, make them explicit, and then give voice to them in ways to help them sort of be more intentional, more thoughtful, and perhaps revise them in ways toward their vision of a good life. And then third, um, it's one reason why I think it's really important to do a modular approach to, to have a four-year character intervention, not just a one-class intervention. If you have four years over uh, that time, you really can change people pretty dramatically. Uh, versus just one class or one year. We find in my classes, for example, though even one class have a major impact on character. I do a class every year called Commencing Character, where we actually focus on the seven strategies and have different virtues we talk about throughout the course. We do pre and post surveys of that class and have a control group to isolate its impact uh, on, on students. And we found last two years uh, that the class actually increases in, in very significant ways, uh, at least eight virtues we targeted over the semester and two virtues we didn't, didn't target. So the way that virtues are connected, like Mike talked about, really you can see that very well in the data that comes out of that survey. And so I think there's a lot of sort of research showing that we can do this work in ways that do have meaningful impacts. Thank you, Michael. I, I, um, I've seen some of that before. I think uh, at places like Wake and, and here at Ohio Northern where most of our students are in that 18 to 29 age group, um, that's one thing. Some, some partners in the network have an awful lot of students who are further along in their lives, and, and obviously that's a different set of issues as well. Um, and, and I think there's, there's also, a, I mean, some character change is going to happen during that time anyway, right? So it's a great time to try to influence it. There have been lots of studies about how cheating, ten, cheating for example, tends to increase, especially in professional schools during those ages. Um, so anything we can do to, to combat that is great. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, JD. Um, Kelly, Kelly, the next question was Kelly's and she said it was very similar to the one that Sarah posed, but she has to step out. Um, but we kind of did the best we could in addressing that one. I think that one remains sort of unanswered and there's more work that we need to do. JD, the next one was yours related to UVA's approach to giving voice to values. I'm not familiar with that uh, initiative. Maybe you can share more with us. So I, I'll just be brief. We don't, but it's a, it, to me, it's an interesting program because very much like some of the anti-racist training, rather than just spend all the time analyzing ethical cases, they act out how they would behave, right? So in the same way that in some anti-racist training, if you've done that, if you hear something racist, you don't just want to think about it and think that's bad, and then 10 minutes later, get, right, get the courage to act, right? If you rehearse five or six times how you're going to respond to that situation, then it just comes naturally. 
And I think there, there's some very promising results after a couple of years of that. It's not just engineering ethics, it's management ethics and, and uh, lots of places she's using that approach. Uh, Jen Teal, I think is her last name. And uh, it just seems promising and, and talked about the same. Let's not just sit around and, and analyze ethical cases all the time, but let's act. And so I, uh, I was just curious if there's any connection there. And I will say, JD, I know George asked about Gentile's work as well, that we are thinking about ways in which to make this uh, active. And I think project-based learning helped us do that in a very effective way to give them the actual case um, sort of cases to actually enact, not just to think about as part of what we think about in, in, in our program. Uh, we're actually inviting Gentile to a conference in the spring at Wake Forest uh, on character in the profession. So please come if you can on March 18th through 20th uh, to Wake Forest, talk about character and engineering and business and, and uh, law and medicine as well. So we'd love to have all of you, if you'd like to come join us in March. So I'm looking at the time and we have one minute left. Um, I think best use of our time, there's a second tab in this Google spreadsheet that says next steps and future engagement. I'm sure, so I looked at Doug, I think he would appreciate if we can, as a group sort of generate some ideas of what we could do next. What are some of the ideas? How do we have these conversations? The questions that Sarah posed that we couldn't fully answer, right? And that are so urgent, what can we do? So if we can take that time um, I don't know if Michael, Mike, you have any other concluding remarks? Uh, I'll just say as, as a philosopher who's new to engineering, it's really for me very encouraging to see the kind of real interest among engineers in this work. I just think it's really great that you all are doing this work, making room for it in your, in your own uh, curricula. And I'm just very encouraged to see how much uh, is coming, coming to the fore in different departments. I always like to add, if you all are thinking about trying something or you're just not quite sure or you have residual questions that, that you're not sharing now, please email us or please email me. I, we would be happy to, to talk through these things. I mean, this is something that has not felt hard for us. I mean, it, it's actually been quite enjoyable and, and, and it makes sense and, and it's not something that's forced. And if there's anything, if there's any way we could try to help create a situation that, that's like that for you, we'd be more than happy to do that. So I always wanna just to offer that to you. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I mean, that, that's, that's also the, the point of Keen, right? And that's, that's, why, that's why I like Keen so much as a network. So look, please take advantage of it. Thank you, Mike, that's well said. For the questions that have been asked that we didn't get to, one of us will reach out and, and share some thoughts in terms of what we've learned. Um, in other cases, that becomes really important resources that we can share with each other. So this that's why this lives in a Google spreadsheet and you all have access to it. It's not lost in the chat. And so we can, the advisory group can revisit all this. Thank you so much everyone for, for making time for this, for this really good conversation. And we hope to have more of this. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, the start of your weekend. Thank you.